because it's not a fear of failure that they're scared of. It's a fear of success. What do I have to get rid of? What am I going to have to sacrifice in order to get what I want? And a lot of people, if it's weight loss, I'm not willing to sacrifice the tasty food. If it's, and you can have tasty food if you're trying to lose weight, by the way, just side note, <laughs> you know, if it's becoming an entrepreneur, it's giving up TV at night um, in order to do that. You don't have to give up TV. You know, you're scared of what you have to sacrifice, but there's ways that you can integrate all of these things that you love with the goals that are pushing you a little further outside of your comfort zone. Welcome back to another episode of the Journey to Legacy podcast. My name is Wayne Veldsman. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm excited to introduce you to our guest, Miss Desiree Petrick of Intentional Action. Man, Desiree has so much stuff going on. She is a leadership and development coach. She is a author, a podcast host. She even runs an in-person leadership summit as well. This episode is jam-packed, full of actionable advice, actionable steps, a lot about actually just taking control of your life, making the choice about who you want to be, what you are going to focus on. Desiree actually does a lot of her coaching related to DISC. If you're not familiar with DISC, give it a Google after you listen to the podcast. It actually lets you figure out uh, your personality type and how you best communicate and work with people. And there's actually a little tidbit in the episode about how she says that you should use DISC to figure out your niche. Super interesting insights. I think you're going to enjoy it a lot. Let's hop on into the episode. Desiree, thanks so much for being here today. I am so excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So I am Desiree Petrick. I am a leadership and development coach, speaker, trainer. I'm a best-selling author. I, I don't even want to bore you with all the different things that I do because it's a lot, but I also have a podcast called Lead with Confidence. The book that I published is Taking Intentional Action, How to Choose the Life You Lead. And I have purposely built an ecosystem around the company that I've created to include all of my favorite things in it so that I can share the value that I feel like I have to provide in any modality that someone could possibly want to learn from. Amazing. Can we, when you say like, you don't want to bore us with all the things that you do, it's almost like that's what we're here for is to learn about all know, it. I know. I mean, those are, you're, you're doing so many different things, right? It's like impressive. I love how you say that you purposefully created this ecosystem. How, how do you have time? to literally publish a book, do all of your coaching, run a podcast, you run an in-person event. How, how do you have time for all this stuff? Well, I was, don't tell my husband I said this, but I was the breadwinner for a while, um, for probably about four years because it's impossible to find daycare where we live in Minnesota. And when COVID happened, it was like twice as hard to find daycare. So I had a management job at a dementia facility through that time. So I was a person that had to go into work. So he ended up staying home with our daughter, which he loved, but he at that time decided to start an entrepreneurial journey as well. So for the last four years, I had been working and he had been building his business. And then a lot of things happened. And all of a sudden I said, you know what? It's my turn. Let's trade. And so I was able to quit my job. Our kids are in part-time care. So we're very fortunate to have three or four days home with them, hanging out as a family. And then we go off and kind of do our own separate things. But that is where my time comes from. And to be completely honest, I don't have time for it all. <laughs> I'm uh, slightly you know, overwhelmed in the best possible way, a majority of my time, but I, I love it all. And I, I wouldn't be able to give away one of my, I consider all of my different things, my children, I wouldn't be able to give away one of them, even if I wanted to. Wow. Amazing. It's funny that you say, right, that you're slightly overwhelmed by everything, but man, having a supportive partner, like made such a huge difference, right? And uh, having an entrepreneurship partner also is, is pretty amazing. Do you think that piece of the puzzle, I don't think I've ever asked anybody this question before, do you think having a partner that's also entrepreneurial minded has made a big difference in your life or shifted how you were able to grow your business? Yes, in many different ways. Although I have to say there is a little bit of tension in the fact that he owns a snow removal and lawn care company. So any money that he spends 
is on a tactical or like a tangible item. It's a, you know, a snowblower or a tractor or all these things. And I'm spending money on certifications and coachings and masterminds. And so that piece I would say is not 100% met eye to eye, but outside of that, the flexibility that we have, um, Monday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we're home with our kids, usually as a family of four. So we're, we're really only working three days a week and we live an extremely minimalistic lifestyle and not minimalistic in the way of like gray walls and nothing anywhere. Like my desk is a disaster right now, but minimalist in the sense of our home is very understated. Our cars are all used, which is good because I would probably crash them and it wouldn't be worth having a new car anyway. <laughs> But um, we worked really hard to pay off our student loans. And so we just, we purposely created a life that we could live it this way. And, you know, people say, well, it must be easy for you. You get to stay home with your kids or your husband. And I'm, I was like, no, I worked full time for a very long time. Like I, this was a very intentional lifestyle that we chose. And we don't, we don't travel. We don't have a ton of nice things. And that's perfect for us. It works perfectly in the life that we've created. So yes. To come back around and answer your question, having someone with that entrepreneurial mindset and the flexible schedule like I have and the ability to kind of, you know, shift focus and to shift responsibilities when we need to be somewhere where our attention needs to be somewhere else has made, I wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. Wow. Yeah. Having that flexibility, right? And I hear you talking about purpose. You mentioned purpose and intention a few times, right? Talk to me a little bit about what what is that, what role does that play in your life? And maybe where did you first start to sort of be this purposeful, intentional self to build the life that you have today? I was always someone who I didn't want to be a boss. I didn't want to be my own boss. I wanted someone to tell me what to do, when oh. to do it. I'd do it well, and then I would go home and not think about it. Um, oh. And I successfully did that for a long time. I think I was 20 five when COVID happened. And all of a sudden, 99% of everything in my life was out of my control. Mm -hmm. And I had a six month old daughter. I was, you know, I hadn't lost any of the weight from that. I was managing a dementia facility through the pandemic. So none of that was within my control. And I said, I need to find one shred of something that I can claim as mine and kind of mold it into what I need to. So I picked up a personal development book and I did it with the intention of trying to lose weight, but that one book turned into two, turned into anywhere from 60 to hundred books a year. And I just, wow. I can't tell you what that has done for my life. Personal development and leadership specifically have been the catalyst to the changes that I've made in my life from one area to the next. And the, when I was deciding to start a business and I, I knew I didn't want my business to be Desiree Petrick speaks or something along those lines. I wanted it to be something that I could grow not necessarily to ever sell. I can't really imagine ever giving it up, but to create a team and to create um, something that people could understand what my company was just by hearing the name of it. And I truly believe that books hold the answer to any question that we have. And the word intention and intentional came up like 12 times over the course of the next week. And I just said, that is what I want to do. That is who I want to be. That is the message that I want to share. And so it's not just about good intentions, though, because if you read the back of my book, you'll see, you know, we all have good intentions to eat better, scroll less, have better relationships, you know, get healthier. But unless we pair that with action and actions in the right direction, we're not going to get anywhere. There is no good intentions without intentional action following it. And so that is what intention has done for my life. It has changed it from being a, you know, chronic weight loss junkie up and down my entire life um, to being someone who loves to exercise and who loves to have that conversation. It's taken me from someone who wanted nothing to do with anything business related other than going to work and getting a paycheck to owning my own company. And my job is literally to go into teams to inspire them to live their best life. So intentionality has changed my life 100%. Wow. Wow. Going from nev never wanting the responsibility of, of business, right? You literally said you wanted to be an employee. You wanted to be told what to do to then uh, when the pandemic hit, that's sort of when that shift happened, right? You realized mm -hmm. that there was so little in your life that you were in control of. And then the catalyst of weight loss 
was what steered you towards personal development and then one book turned into two to three to what 60 to a 100 a year to mm-hmm. now the life that you live amazing and then you're talking about intention right pairing it with action intention doesn't mean anything unless it's paired with action T- tell us a little bit more about that maybe treat us as one of your coaching clients right pretend that i have great intentions i have huge aspirations for myself in this life but i'm not really taking action what's what's my problem what what should i do here Well, I think the question is to ask the very first chapter in my book is evaluate your excuses in the sense of there's a reason why you haven't taken action. And those excuses might be 100% valid. You may no longer actually want that thing, but because you set it as an intention, you set that goal. It's hard to let go of those things. So Mm -hmm. it may just truly be that you don't want that thing anymore. And that's okay. It might be that there's something or someone standing in your way that with one conversation or one decision on your part could completely eradicate that excuse. You know, it might be YOLO or the excuse of always asking people for grace to say, you know, it's a busy season and I need grace right now when what you need is not grace. What you need is a good kick in the butt or, you know, someone giving you hands on help. So a lot of it comes down to what are your excuses? Why are you not taking action? There's an excuse. There's a reason. And it might be a good one. But unless you're digging deeper and looking into that and asking yourself the hard questions, there will be no action. There can't be. There is, you know, physically, you know, something in your way that you need to figure out. So my question to you would be, what is the thought that keeps coming up in your head that's stopping you from taking action? Mm -hmm. Evaluating first what's going on, what is actually stopping you. You know, it's interesting because I think too many people these days have heard the ideas of, you know, with intentions, what's the word I'm looking for? They say, I am statements, right, to themselves, not aspirations. What's what's the word that I'm looking affirmations. for? Affirmations. Affirmations. Thank you. You're right. They, they say affirmations. They try and convince themselves that they are somebody that they're not currently, right, saying things in present tense, but without letting go of their current state with these past ideas that they've told themselves, there's really no room for this new person to come in, right? It's interesting. Have have you come across actually a a client or even yourself where exactly what you just said, you have a good past intention, but because you said it, now you want to move forward, but you can't, like you maybe you feel like a little bit of a hypocrite. Well, yeah, I wanted to manage a big company, you know, again, I told myself first, I didn't want to manage, then I went into wanting to manage a big company. And then all of a sudden, I was like, I have one child with another on the way, I didn't want to manage anymore. And so Mm -hmm. I kept telling myself that I had to stay where I was because I had worked so hard to get there. And I wasn't I was just eliminating my excuses and saying, the thoughts I'm having don't matter. The things that I want don't matter because I work so hard to get here. Where in the Mm -hmm. end, that's why I don't say eliminate your excuses because if you just keep pushing them away and away and away, you're going to keep getting further from the actual destination that you want to get to. And as opposed to that, evaluating why. And I said, the money doesn't matter to me. The status doesn't matter to me. At one point, I loved the challenge of it. And now that there's different priorities in my life, that challenge is no longer appealing to me. So I literally evaluated the excuses that I was giving myself and ended up going part-time in an events position, totally 180 from where I was. And I loved it. I fell in love with it. And it ended up being that second piece of the catalyst for why I, why I started my business and who I wanted to help in that business. So it you can't pick a destination. We're too far from it. You end up in uncharted territory and you're just kind of like turning in circles. What do I do next? There's a comfort zone and that's where we all kind of sit most of the time. And one step, two steps, maybe three steps out of that is that growth zone. But if we're setting our intentions too far in the future, we don't have a good clear direction of how to get there. We have to take those smaller steps in the right direction to set a trajectory for what it is that we ultimately want. It doesn't mean that you won't get that big thing, that thing that's, you know, out a little too far in the distance for us to grasp right now. It just means you have to take uh, smaller steps to get there. Amazing. 
that's I love that so much. Honestly, I want everybody to to hit that thirty second rewind button and listen to it again because you're right, right? It sounds like this is something that we talked about prior to the interview. Actually, the noted was to detach yourself from the outcome, right? Take control of what you can control now. Continue mm-hmm. to take one step at a time in the right direction. Is that something you find holds people back a lot of the time? Is that they're thinking too far in the future, thinking of the outcome and not just the next step? It's a little bit of both. They're either thinking so far outside of the realm of what's possible right now that they end up talking themselves out of it before they even start. Or they're so stuck in, I don't want to try and grow because it's not a fear of failure that they're scared of. It's a fear of success. What do I have to get rid of? What am I going to have to sacrifice in order to get what I want? And a lot of people, if it's weight loss, I'm not willing to sacrifice the tasty food if it's, and you can have tasty food if you're trying to lose weight, by the way, just side note, (laughs) you know, if it's becoming an entrepreneur, it's giving up TV at night um, in order to do that. You don't have to give up TV. You know, you're scared of what you have to sacrifice, but there's ways that you can integrate all of these things that you love with the goals that are pushing you a little further outside of your comfort zone. So that that would be my message to anyone is those things that were scared to sacrifice the things that were scared to give up you can incorporate them in to your life as you're moving forward and it, they don't have to be the thing that holds you back in fact they shouldn't be the thing that holds you back fear of success is such an interesting thought right i don't think many people realize that this is a thing but how the way that you put it just now as far as success and to reach success means that you're going to have to sacrifice things and that can absolutely be what holds people back i'm i'm curious to hear a little little bit more about your your story right to catch people up to what i already know growing Mm -hmm. up you bounced around a few different schools you went to college got a management degree you had a tough time finding a job eventually you did and what you prompted us a little bit earlier was that you didn't really feel great in the position you want to make a shift but you put so much time and effort into the position right what what was that like it seems like it relates a little bit to maybe this fear of success or fear of losing what you've already put in right tell us a little bit more about about your journey about your story especially that that piece of the puzzle yeah well it's funny because i never moved houses i I lived in my childhood at home my whole life but I moved schools in that at sixth grade, one of the schools shut down. So I had to go to another town for the two years of junior high and then switch to the town that my mom was working in. And then, you know, when you move around that much, it's hard to have really deep relationships with people. And I'm a disc consultant. So I always bring it back to kind of that personality assessment. But I think that I have kind of this DI, if you know anything about disc in that I'm slightly assertive. Um, I call myself aggressively friendly. I make friendships really, really easily, but I don't necessarily have a ton of deep relationships because when you go through something like that, you start to kind of pull back and peel off of trying to get deep with anyone because you never know where it's going to lead. So I was friends with every single person in high school, but not great friends with any of them. It's kind of like finding your niche. I didn't have a niche. I was just kind of everything because I, um, I was so scared that someone wouldn't like me that I, made sure that everyone did. But in 11th grade, I got the opportunity to do um, PSEO, which is essentially going to college early. So I did that, which was my fourth school. And then when I actually went to college, I went to another college. So I lied to you. It was five schools by the time I graduated. (laughs) And I don't regret any of that. I think it made me who I am. So that's fantastic. But I went with a management degree. I wanted to be like my mom, be in healthcare administration, and I can't do biology or chemistry. So the the whole nursing field was out, but the administration piece I could do. And I think I just had this expectation because it's kind of what adults tell you is if you go to college, you'll get a good job. And yeah. so I'm sitting in a waitressing job. Like, why is no one hiring me right now? Why is no one hiring me for these management positions? I was told if I got the degree, I would get one. And yeah. finally, I just said, screw it, I'm going to go in for an assistant position and just try and work my way up, as I probably should have attempted to do right away. But I walked out of the interview for um, an assistant position with a management position. So it was just kind of getting in the door. But it turns out there was a reason I hadn't been hired 
yet for a management position because I had no management experience whatsoever. Um, I've talked about this with my employees at the time and just kind of made sure that my story was correct. And yes, it turns out I was not a good manager. <laughs> I was, like I said, very aggressive, very assertive. I was scared that people would think that I didn't know what I was doing. And so I overcompensated for that. I was very nervous that, you know, I was responsible for the outcome that was going to happen within the company. And so I made sure that I was micromanaging everything, making sure everyone was doing what I thought that they needed to do. And that's kind of catches up us up to the point where then COVID hit. And all of a sudden I couldn't go back in where the the tenants were anymore because if I didn't have the gloves and the mask and the shield and all the things, I wasn't allowed back there. Mm -hmm. So any control that I had, even over my management position was gone. I couldn't allow family members to come in and see their parents. These tenants who had dementia, which means that they don't necessarily know what's going on around them, couldn't understand why they were seeing their new great grandbaby through a window and not being able to hold them. And so all of these things and all of these emotions and this vulnerability came out, we all had this very similar circumstance. For the first time in my life, everyone was kind of on a, a level playing field of not having any control. And that's when I started to feel that empathy towards people and read books about relationships and communication and leadership and personal development and weight loss and all of the different things. And the combination of those, it's why I love podcasts so much is that you don't know what you don't know. And until you take yeah. a really good inside look at who you are and your self-awareness and your emotional and social intelligence, there's nothing that you can do to become better because it starts with you. So that's essentially uh, what I did after COVID. I was like, well, I've made it. I've, you know, I feel like I succeeded at this job. I got them through the pandemic. Not obviously me. I had a fantastic team that yeah, sure. we all worked together to do it, but I ended up leaving got a part-time position as an events coordinator, which I absolutely loved, but I was pregnant with my son at the time. And when he was born, he was born during a blizzard in Minnesota, shocker. And our hospital didn't happen to have a NICU. So we couldn't get the fixed wing airplanes, helicopters, ambulances, nothing from the NICU about an hour and a half away could get to us. So that was a time of self-reflection of, again, nothing is in my control. I couldn't, we had none of the equipment we needed to keep him alive. The doctors didn't have the the necessary medicine or the skills necessarily to keep him alive. I had 15 doctors plus the pediatrician took his whole day off to sit next to my son. And the only thing I could control and my husband as well in that moment was our viewpoint on the subject. No family could come in because despite the fact that, you know, on the outside world, COVID restrictions had seemed to kind of go away. The restrictions inside a hospital were still there. And so my family was not there. It was my husband and I, and I had just had a baby and no one was paying attention because they were all trying to keep my son alive, which I was thankful for. But it's like, you have to have a lot of self-work happening at that time in order to make it through that. So Desiree, if I, mean, if I can, if I can in interrupt you and pause you, but there's just so much here to to unpack from you know a couple things that that I note noted here I, I take a lot I take a lot of notes for people that don't watch watch the videos um you know you saying that your personality style I love that you coach a lot of on disc right your personality style from when you were in school to how you made friends to not really close relationships actually plays a little bit of a role in seemingly in itself to how you pick a niche in life right moving forward to how like you know you didn't know you weren't taught to actually work your way up in a company right after school you thought well i have this degree i should get a job right but nobody was giving you a job right little did you know if you had just started as an assistant and worked your way up turns out little did you know if you had just went and interviewed for an assistant job you would have actually mm -hmm. gotten the management job that you wanted to you put so much time and effort in going all the way to of course like such a intense traumatic time where literally right COVID hit you had your son couldn't get the supplies you guys needed in like the town that you're in leading to big catalysts in this entire time right you're realizing everything's out of your control right so so much a couple things just to touch on here real real quick 
your personality type that you mentioned, right? Talking about how picking picking a niche, right, is important. Let's just focus on that real quick. Tell everybody what what's the benefit of of pick, picking a niche. What what even is that? How can people sort of navigate it? It's funny because in business, I don't necessarily. I'm going to go against a lot of expert opinions here, but I don't necessarily believe you need a niche in that sense. I mean, look at all the stuff I'm doing. I clearly haven't picked one, sure. but in business, I do think, or in life, I do think that it's important that we understand ourselves well enough to know I could have never done anything analytical in the sense of nursing or paperwork type things, because I truly am a very high people oriented individual and those slower tasks that take a lot of discernment, that was not me. So realizing that about myself helped me to kind of say, this is the kind of position that I would thrive in. And then to ask the second question of, do I want to do that? It's just, sure, it gives sure. you an opportunity to ask yourself the right questions so you can make the right decisions. So I, I like love it. DISC. Nice. So DISC and for niche here is your own saying, pick the quote unquote niche of what you're good at, what your personality steer into that one specific niche down area of what you are best at, what your personality is best at, not necessarily one client or one business. Right. Because even in the workplace, we have to learn how to communicate with those other styles. But if we're not putting ourselves in the the right situation to succeed, then we're not going to have the right attitude, the right determination or drive to want to connect with other people. It really does start nice. with our own self-awareness in that sense. Nice. And so Desiree, now you do a, you do a lot of leadership coaching, right? Mm -hmm. One thing you mentioned was when you started this job, you were overcompensating because you felt that you didn't really know what you were doing with aggression, micromanaging, right? It turns out that those weren't the correct leadership tactics to take is what it sounds like. Yeah. Well, you know, trust can be defined as you ask someone to do something and they do it. And so you trust them. Trust can also be defined as a vulnerability based trust. And I did not have that. I was not letting anyone look at me and further past the mask that I was wearing. And so I didn't truly have a base of trust with anyone that I was working with. It was when we all got on that level playing field that that shield had to come down. There was no option. And we all got to know each other better. That vulnerability-based trust is what created our team in order to be able to kind of grow together. And that's a concept from Patrick Lynchoni's book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, which I happen to be facil a facilitator in. But, um, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. It's it was 100% about taking down that mask of micromanaging and overcompensating and feeling like I knew everything because I obviously didn't. And everyone else knew that, but I was yeah. trying to put on this mask that I did. Amazing. And so carrying on in the story, right, is traumatic experiences are starting to happen and you're realizing things that are more and more out of your control. I think a lot of people in the world in today's life sort of make themselves miserable because they tend to focus on the things they can't control versus they can control. How how would you coach or what what are your sort of insights on that versus focusing on the controllables versus the non-controllables? Well, the topic of my book was I started out by trying to figure out my mom passed away just three months after my son was born. So 24 hours after we got home from the NICU, she had a stroke. And again, COVID restrictions, I wasn't allowed to see her. So for two months, I had to choose between my newborn son and my mom because I couldn't have both. And obviously, I chose my newborn son in that moment. But after she passed away, I was questioning. I'm like, I feel sad, obviously, but I feel okay. Yeah. Like, I feel like I still can find happiness and joy and thankfulness and appreciation for the things in my life. And why am I not depressed? Why did I not break down? I couldn't figure it out because I felt like I should have. She was my best friend in the whole world. Yeah. And so I actually reverse engineered the last four years of my life to say, how did I build up this foundation of this person that I had become? And it's a tiered system of self-engagement, self-worth, and self-awareness that I feel like I was almost preparing for something prior to that thing actually happening or actually not knowing what that thing was going to be. And that's what I tell people. It's the framework that I use to help people to build up that foundation so that they can start to build a life they love now 
before they get fired or injured or someone passes away or something happens, you know, the flooding that's going on in Minnesota right now, your house gets washed away. Do you have a foundation as a human to handle that both mentally and emotionally and with the relationships that you've created? We have to start now. And I 100% agree with you that people are making themselves miserable, but it's not intentionally. It's because of a lack of knowledge, a lack of knowing what it could look like. So I did not have time to write a book, but I said this message and this process that I went through was so impactful. I needed to figure out how to share it. And that was the lowest cost barrier way that I could figure out how to do that for the most number of people. So all of these stories that I'm telling you are told within more detail in the book if anyone is interested. But yeah, the foundation of self framework, it changed my life and I still use it to this day with coaching and just with myself. Amazing. Your book, Taking Intentional Action, will link in the show notes. Everybody definitely can go check it out. But man, like you're so right about let's start to take action, build this foundation before something huge happens, right? Oh, it's just it's just crazy. And I hope that people are listening to podcasts like this. People start reading books and this can be the message. This can be the thing that makes them realize, you know what, let me start. Let me not wait. Because Desiree, you'd be surprised the amount of people that I interview that go through a huge traumatic episode, which is like the shift. And I think so much of our message should just be, listen, hear this, take action before something like that happens to you. Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you the number of people who have already had something happen to them and they wish that they would have started sooner. So don't let yourself be that person. And if you are that person, just know that it's not too late to start to build that life. The subtitle of the book is how to choose the life you lead. It is a choice. It is a decision that we are actively making towards a life that we love. If you see someone's life that you are jealous of or envious of, you can have maybe not the entire picture of it, but you can have bits and pieces, the pieces that make you want to aspire to that. You just have to choose them and figure out what it would look like for you to put in, put it in your life. Excuse it. I could not agree with you more. I so consistently just tell everybody it's a choice. And so Desiree, I always like to wrap up our interviews um, with the sort of theme of the show, right? Being around legacy. And now that you talked about choice, I'd love to ask you, what's the legacy that you are choosing and will ultimately leave in this world? My mom started my legacy. She left me a very small amount of money when she passed away and I used it to start my company. And I said, she was the most kind, generous, even keeled, ambitious woman I've ever met. And I want to help bring those aspects into the working world. It's why I created a leadership company so that I could share my love with the things I learned from her in this company. But I've also got two kids. I want to create something that if one day they want to live in this life that I've created, I can leave that legacy for them. And hopefully for all of the people who've listened to my podcast or read my book or been in one of my coaching programs or heard a keynote or whatever modality it happens to be in, I just want to leave that legacy of you get to decide the life that you want. And if you don't know how, I can help you. And that's a wrap, everybody. Desiree, thank you so, so much. Everybody out there, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like the episode, please share it with a friend, a family member, a colleague, anybody and everybody who you think you can get value from today. Man, what awesome stuff, right? An interesting story, going through so many different schools to management, to this big shift, right? She totally left management and went into like events coordination, if you guys didn't even get that, right before all this trauma happened, right? During COVID with her son in the ICU and her mom passing away at the same time. And yet she decided to choose personal development, to choose purpose, right? To choose intentional action. Things, traumatic events like that can be paralyzing. But yet we have to realize that it's our choice day to day what we do. Let's focus on the things that we control, not the things that we can't control. Everybody, thanks again for being here. If you haven't yet, go check out the Journey to Legacy community. It's linked down in the show notes. It's a place where like-minded people like Desiree, we're all getting together to help each other to grow and to leave the world a better place. 
to spread kindness, generosity, hard work, just like Desiree is doing, just like her mom taught her to do. Everybody, thanks again for being here today. I greatly appreciate it. Till next time, you've been listening to the Journey to Legacy podcast.